Good morning. It is the Lord's gathering. Um, it is October the 26th. It's the last Saturday of the month of October, and it is 11.43. Starting off late this morning, I had to resolve or address some things, and so that's why we are starting a little later today. Normally, I start actually a little before 11, but I had to, um, I had to get myself together because one thing I, uh, one thing I will not do is give out in a polluted manner. If my heart is not right, I'm not going to give out when my heart is not right so i had to get myself right and uh, so i'm to a point where i can do what the lord will have me to do in obedience and uh i even contemplating contemplated contemplated i don't know if i'm saying that word right not even having bible study today because of uh, the way I was feeling, and um, uh, it's it's important to me to be obedient in what the Lord has charged me to do, has placed me to be steward over. And I don't want to do it in a spirit of error. I don't want to infect God's people. Um, so, um, had to get myself together. I had to, in all transparency, had to get myself together. Uh, this life is not one without issues. It's not a life without pain. It's not a life without wounds. And just as Christ had to walk to the place of the cross, carrying his cross, he had wounds. He couldn't stop. He couldn't stop and say, "Time out. Let me heal from what you inflicted on me before I allow you to put me on a cross um, and nail me, should I say, to a cross and and die." He had to walk out his ministry even through the wounds and the pain and his bleeding to accomplish his purpose here on earth. And so I come before you. I'm, I'm still hurting. I'm still wounded. Um, but I won't, not to a place where I will infect God's people negatively. Uh, full transparency. Um, it's hard sometimes when the Lord tells you not to defend yourself. when you know the truth and you can't defend yourself with the truth because he says, I'm your defender. And when people rather believe a lie, because it may sound so real from the person it's coming from in, 
So people rather believe. Person's narrative about you. You've been charged to keep your mouth shut. And when you are in a situation to where you're unheard, and it's an ongoing pattern of being unheard, and it's an ongoing pattern of being misunderstood and when it's an ongoing pattern of the same thing is not for a lack of you expressing your feelings. It's not for a lack of you telling the person what you're doing hurts me. Can you not do that? It's not, it's, but they keep doing it anyway. What do you do? If you have found yourself getting in the flesh and responding out of the flesh and acting out of the flesh, you, if of course you have the Holy Spirit, he will correct you and tell you to get it right. And then you go to the person and you, you don't say, I'm sorry. You ask them to forgive you because, you know, you acted out of concert. You know, you acted in a way, you behaved in a way that does not please the Lord, that does not bring him glory. So you ask them to forgive you, which is a difference. People are so sorry today. They're sorry without repentance. That's why they can keep doing the same thing over and over again because they're just sorry. There's no contractness. There's no brokenness that you've hurt another person with your actions. So what do you do? You continue doing what you know the Lord would have you to do, even through your tears even through the wounds that keep opening because the person keeps opening them. It's like you are never allowed to fully heal because they keep opening the same wounds and making new ones. And you tell them that and they look at you like you are not speaking Greek, like you're not speaking English, like it's foreign to them. Like, what do you mean? You know, the gaslighting, the non-responsibility of one's actions. But you know that you can't do the same thing that they're doing because scripture tells us not to render evil for evil. And even though your flesh may want to, you don't give in to the flesh. This walk has never been easy, but it has certainly not been easy since my visitation April or May of last year. And to top it off, I'm a woman who lives in a Christian society where it's divided, where one part says women ought to be quiet, shut up, learn at home. They have no authority in the church. And there's another group that says women have been given authority. Women are able to speak. Women are able to have leadership positions in the body of Christ. When will the division cease? The scribes and Pharisees had their division too. One set believed in the resurrection. The other set didn't believe in the resurrection. 
we we are constantly constantly at odds in the body of Christ. Why is the body of Christ still divided? Christ is not coming back for a divided body. He's coming back for one body of singleness, heart, mind, and spirit. That is speaking the same thing. That is walking out the same thing. That is operating in unity and in love. But we can't get basic tendons, basic foundation straight. Christ is not coming back for a body that's in a state of confusion about who they are and what they believe and what they'll follow. I'm not going to be before you long. I, some time ago, I shared a truth. Might have been last year. And it's still relevant today. I haven't found a body or a believer, especially one in leadership. that their word can be trusted. And I, I, I never found healing in church. I never found safety in church. I, I never found those things, even those those things are to be part of the body. What I found is pain, great pain. What I've experienced at the hands of leadership. They, they talk about you. Some of them abuse their authority. Some believe that You're a slave. I never seen a leader that was selfless and served. I've seen leaders that wanted to be served and almost demanded to be served. But I've never met a selfless leader in the body of Christ. I'm sure they exist. But I've never experienced that. That gives to themselves, that give of themselves. Without hesitation, reservation, without reciprocation. I read it in my time of being on the backside of the desert. I submit myself to that, being made into that. Because Christ said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Oh, if we only had that kind of mindset in the body. To serve, to give. But that is what it is. Uh, I'm going to pray the psalm, Psalms 91 today. Uh, in our prayer, 
and then I will read our standing announcements, and then I will go over the purposes of the Bible study. Psalms 91, and I'm reading it in the Amplified. So it's fascinating. He that dwelleth, I'm sorry, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable, fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress and my God on him I lean and rely. And in him I confidently trust. For then he will deliver you from the sneer of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Then he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings shall you trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and a buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the arrow, the evil plots and slander of the wicked that flies by night, nor of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay wait at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only a scepter shall you be yourself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High as you witness the reward of the wicked. Not a scepter, a spectator. Cha. <laughs> wait, that goes all right. Wait, wait, right. I have a read it like that. <laughs> spectator. Yeah, I told you. Oh, Lord, Holy Spirit, you were something about. I'm special. I understand that. Uh, and all by limitations is, is special. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, wait, that does not sound. Why will you be a scepter? <laughs> that spelled differently, too. Okay, I needed that moment. Expectator. <laughs> Only expectator shall you be yourself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High as you witness the reward of the wicked. I know y'all probably saying, that girl don't know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus. Oh Lord, you is too much. Oh my gosh, that is too funny. Spectator guys. Not a scepter. <laughs> I guess I should have paused on that, but in full transparency. Oh, you've witnessed my specialness in full, full, full action on today. <laughs> <laughs> Expectator, shall you be yourself inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High as you witness the reward of the wicked, because you have been made the Lord, because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your dwelling place. There shall no evil befall you, nor any plague or calamity come near your tent. But he will give you his angels charge over you to accompany and defend and preserve you in all your ways of obedience and service. They shall bear you up on their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion in the serpent shall you trample underfoot because he has set his love upon me therefore will i deliver him i will set him on high because he knows 
and understands my name as a personal knowledge of my mercy, love and kindness, trusts and relies on me knowing I will never forsake him. No, never. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. That was from me. Yeah. So help me today. <sighs> our standing announcements is our call to prayer. It's first and last Friday of every month at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. We concluded the book of Daniel yesterday. So Daniel, the book of Daniel only had 12 chapters and we did two chapters each month except for yesterday which was just chapter 12. There's covenant prayer every day at 11 a.m. Mountain Time and every evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. You can send your prayer request to the Lord's Gathering, 11-2023 at gmail.com. And we fast every day until noon. Um, it may change here and there, but right now during this time of being set apart, we have been fasting until noon every day, and it started on August. <clears throat> the purposes of our gathering, the reason why The charge I've been given for the Lord's gathering, the reason why the Lord charged me to start gathering for Bible study. Um, and I guess that's why I'm I'm, I'm ended up doing it. Uh, it's just me because. People couldn't endorse sound doctrine. And all transparency, there was offense. People were offended by the truth. All transparency, people thought this was a social hour, not a time to regain ground, not a time. to pick up things they dropped. The Lord gives his people opportunity to grow, to be renewed, to be restored. He doesn't force it on anyone. And he started with Turning Point Deliverance Church, the remnant from that house. He started with them first to give them an opportunity to be restored and renewed and refreshed to repent of their stagnant stagnation, to repent of their idleness, to repent of their um, hiding, which was is not God ordained hiding; it's self induced hiding. To repent from their compromise and their complacencies, but some wanted to do things their way. Some rebelled. Some rejected. Some didn't want it. It ain't forced on anybody.
the Lord gave a timeline, his timeline. He never gave it to me. Some thought they didn't need it. The Lord always gives opportunity to his people for forgiveness and repentance and brokenness and contriteness before judgment comes. Because you can't say you didn't know or that you didn't have an opportunity. I can't believe the amount of resistance the fight against. And it just amazes me how we can say with our mouth, I want what the Lord wants. I will do what the Lord wants, just like the children of Israel. But we'll fight and reject, rebel against the way the Lord wants to bring it about. Because your way has worked so long, all these years. Your way has worked for you. But the Lord sought to bring a better way. How he chose to bring the better way. And for most, it was rejected. Because who does she think she is? And a person in need of a better way. I'm not anyone special. You have those that have said, well, if it's God, it will last. Some thought it's not going to last anyway. You don't need a crowd to preach. I can preach to rocks. I don't make a break this and neither did you. But it's going to be by your word you'll be judged. Not mine. One thing I am so certain about that there are going to be times that the Lord will have you by yourself. But even Elijah had Elisha. Even Moses had Joshua. Even Christ had his 11 disciples. The reason why I'm leaving out Judas is because he might have started out with Christ, but he didn't end with Christ. So I'm just focusing on the 11. Even Christ had his 11 disciples. And even they walked with him still with unbelief. They saw the miracles firsthand. So if you're wondering why we started out with between eight and nine people from, from Illinois to Georgia to Florida to Delaware, Philadelphia, Colorado. People, some came not with the intentions of changing who they were. But they wanted to flatter. They love to flatter. Flatter, flatter, flatter. Because I'm going to flatter you so that you don't see who I really am. Let me give you some accolades. I don't need you to give me accolades. 
I seek you through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. I might not say anything because he hasn't charged me to. But I see you. I don't like flatter. It's deception. It's lies. So this walk is the walk of dying to you. And when you die to you, you're not dying to you with an entourage. Because when Christ walked that walk, he did it alone. His disciples were nowhere to be found. But he walked his walk with his cross. So, I'm here doing the work he's charged me to do by myself. Go ahead and start out that way. But that's what it is right now. How it ends, when it ends, that's not up to me. You think I don't know your insincerity when you say, oh, what has the Lord done for you lately? Or what has the Lord given you today? What has the Lord been dealing with you about? I know there's not a sincere bone in your body when you ask me that. That's just a religious thing to do. When secretly in your heart you have envy and jealousy. But we are such people of deniers because we deny, 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 deny. That, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. No wonder why people aren't being delivered because you lie about who you are. So when deliverance comes, it, it just has to, it has to go another way because you are not willing to believe the filter and mirror that the Lord sees you with. I don't know how many times I've heard, I'm not rebellious, I'm not stubborn, I'm not defiant, I'm not rebellious, I respect you. And the latter was the truth. It's grave disrespect. But want to demand your respect. You know what the Lord told me? He said, they get respect when they have given respect. Do we want to pick and choose who we want to uh, uh, address as uh, uh, the leadership that they are? Whether or not we think they deserve it or have earned it, that is not up to you. Even David was put in check when he overstepped his boundaries with King Saul. Though uh, the King Saul was already replaced, David didn't walk in that yet because it wasn't his. It was his, but it wasn't his. So he still had to mind his manners. Even in his process for the kingship, he was in his process. From the time he was anointed to the time he took the throne. That middle that middle part was his process. He still had to respect the office. And we sitting around here being disrespectful to other men and women of God, whether we think they deserve the title or not, that ain't up to you. 
If they're pastor, then you call them pastor, whether you respect them as a pastor or not. Who do you think you are? But you demand respect. The Lord says not so. You don't respect his people, and yet you deserve and posture yourself in the spirit of pride, wanting to demand respect. When you start giving respect, you will receive respect. To God be the glory in that. Just to provoke. Yeah, I know I provoked you today. I just hope you've been provoked in the right way to love and good works, not to strife and anger. But then the truth of it is what's in you will be the thing that is provoked. If there's anger and strife in you, that's going to be manifest. But if there's love and good works in you, that's going to be manifest also. Because what's in you is going to come out 1,000% of the time. To provoke, to stir up, to expose, to renew, to reprove, for resuscitation, to restore, to bring edification, to bring exhortation. <clears throat> I hear the wow, sorry. To bring correction, to rebuke, to build and rebuild, to destroy and tear down, for training, for equipping, for sharpening, for demonstrating the love of Christ, whatever that looks like, for accuracy, for godly separation when it's needed, for deliverance. For spiritual and natural growth, for setting godly order, for spiritual and natural development, not providing an environment for fostering and incubating excuses, for sifting the wheat from the chaff, for acceleration, for renouncing. and identifying and closing all demonic doorways for encouragement to provide a place for healthy external and internal healing, to forgive from our hearts, letting go to loose, to release those that have wronged us, hurt us, abandoned us, betrayed us, and slandered us, allowing manifestations good and bad and dealing with them once they have been exposed and revealed for exhibiting authentic Christian living, protesting to allow the dunamis power of the Holy Ghost to be manifested in us, around us, upon us, and to operate in signs and wonders produced by the Holy Spirit, becoming intimate with and in the truth, which is Jesus, for activation to walk in kingdom mindset and operation, to challenge mindsets and traditions that offend the Lord. To allow the shaking of our foundations. You know, and that's, when I think about that's the spirit of pride when
you know, people that are constant redecorators that will constantly redecorate their bathroom or redecorate their house every so often. Why do you think that is? But yet, when our spirit man needs to be re-renovated and changed and shaken to expose what's there, we fight against it. We don't need to do that. It's not that deep. It's not that serious. That is pride. That's pride. When you don't think you need to change, when you don't think you need to be shaken, when you don't think you need to improve yourself in the spirit, why you don't think you need to improve yourself in the spirit. That you feel that you're okay just the way you are. But the Lord is saying, you're not okay the way you are. I cannot accept you the way you are. I need my spirit to come in and purify you from the inside out. But you reject his purification. Why do we reject it? Because we have to do something. And if we just be honest, say, I don't want to do it. It's too much work. I like the way that I am. Don't judge me. Well, I don't pray like you and I don't have to pray. Who said that you had to pray like me? Because I don't, I don't pray like anybody else but myself. I have my own prayer language. And I'm not talking about tongues. But you got to pray. And pray with truth. I'm constantly telling a person. The Lord don't speak to me. The Lord don't speak to me. I, I pray but he don't answer me. You have to answer. You got to ask the question is why you can't hear the Lord. Is it something in you preventing the Lord to answer you? As, have you even asked him to perfect? No. So you can have sin on board, not even know it, but you asking him to do this for me, do that for me, do this for me, but not once forgive me from my sins. Not one cleanse me from all unrighteousness, not once cleanse me from those things that offend you, not once deliver me from lying, deliver me from this, deliver me from, no. Well, no wonder why he ain't answering you. Well, no, why? Because you're praying with the door shut He's still on the other side knocking. So you're speaking to him through the door with the door shut. Lord, this is what I want you to do for me. Lord, can you do this? Lord, can you do that? Not once opening up the door. Because if you open it up, then he then then that's when the party really happens. But we don't want to open up that door. We want to talk to the Lord through a closed door. I want to talk to you through a closed door because you just might say something to me that I don't like. Yeah, he just might. You might show me something that I won't agree with. I'm not ready to give up. 
because I like the I like the way this thing makes me feel and I like the fruits of this thing. So I'm not ready. So therefore, I'm going to keep you behind the door that you're knocking on. What is that? Revelation 3.20? Let me see. I, I could be wrong. No. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. But we keep the Lord behind the closed door. The Amplified says to that, I'm reading the Amplified Classic now of Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and listens and heeds my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will eat with him and he will eat with me. So it takes an action on your part. What is the action you say? You have to open the door. That's what the Bible says. It didn't say the Lord was going to open up the door. What it says is the Lord is knocking. And it says, if any man hears my voice and opens the door. It didn't say the Lord was going to open the door. It says you have to when you hear him knocking. But we too keeping him, we, we're, we're too busy keeping him behind this closed locked door. Say, oh, I want you, Lord. And I want everything you got for me. But I want it on my time. I want it my way. If we just be honest and say, I do, I have the door closed because I'm not ready for the door to be open yet. Because I don't know what he's going to say. I don't know what he's going to show me. I don't want to, I don't, I, the fear of the unknown. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. For accountability, for reigniting the fire, for kingdom purpose in our first love, to identify and tear down demonic strongholds, for spiritual house cleaning and maintenance. Because God forbid we, we, we maintain deliverance, we maintain a clean life. We start out well, but we don't end up that way. And every time you let go of that plow, Satan's kingdom fortifies himself each time. And it's, each time it becomes, it becomes harder, not impossible, but harder to break free.
So each time you let go, each time you backslide, each time you turn your back on the Lord, each time you reject him, Satan's kingdom fortifies itself in you, becoming harder, but not impossible to get free from. Transparency. Do I like doing this by myself? No. Do I like not having spiritual support? No. Do I like not having support from those around me? No. Is that going to stop me from doing what the Lord has charged me to do? No. Does it hurt? Yes. Do I trust the Lord? Absolutely. Absolutely. With every tear I cry. Absolutely. Man has failed me 1,000%, but the Lord has not. Man's virgin of love hurts. We hurt each other. Satan loves that we hurt each other. Satan loves that we inflict wounds on our husbands, on our wives, on our children, on our siblings, our friendships. Satan absolutely loves that because he knows that some won't bounce back from the wounds, from the pain, from the hurt. Most won't. Some will. The operation of midwife with pushing and birthing for conviction, for returning honor and fear back to God, to identify compromised postures and behaviors of complacency that causes us to become comfortable and at ease and lazy, for adjusting, for adjusting our focus back to and on the things of the Lord. To bring awareness of our minds concerning ways, patterns, and habits of our thinking and behavior. That do not please the Lord. Reprogramming of our muscle memory from the old man to the new man that is supposed to be in Christ, which is conversion, living and accepting the call and responsibility of being a Christian instead of just wanting and walking in the title of being a Christian. Most of us are just title wearing Christians. You just have the title, not the life. You know, having a form of godliness, looking the part, but not being a part. For fruit examination, which is not judging. To promote daily self-examination. To study the word. 
becoming hearers and doers of the word. To be ready at all times. To be a people and children of obedience. To accept, submit, yield, surrender, and not despise the discipline, chastening of the Lord in whatever form it comes. To be applicators and replicators of Christ in his nature, his character, his word, and his ways. Development of godly discipline in our walk of life. Being examples worthy to be followed. Living and exhibiting truth, which is Jesus. To be creative, to revive, to be revived. For resurgence, resurgence, for protection, for preservation, to cover, to restore covenant, to be a people of active faith to adhere to sound doctrine and to be fruitful. That these are the purposes of the reason for this gathering. So to God be the glory on that. I'm going to read during my prayer this week. This word came to me again. I've used it before. Um, I'm not sure, I probably have, but I want to do it again. Read the definition of abdicate, because that's, that is something that we have and are guilty of. Abdicating our authority, abdicating our station, abdicating our Inheritance, like Esau, for something inferior. Because we want a immediate gratification instead of walking out in abundance for the long term. We want a right now gratification, but not a long term abundance. Because we're not willing to wait, we're not willing to be patient, we're not willing to trust. Abdicate of a monarch, renounce one's throne. Synonyms to resign, retire, quit, stand down, step down, blow out. Renounce the throne, resign from, relinquish, give up, hand over, turn, turn over. Surrender, vacate, deliver up, disclaim. Definition number two says, fail to fulfill or undertake a responsibility or duty. Disown, turn down, spurn. Avoid, give up, renounce, reject. Refuse, relinquish. Wave, yield, forgo, abandon. Cast aside, surrender, drop, turn 
one's back on. Wash one's hands of. Forsake. Those are the synonyms of the second definition. We are guilty of rejecting, of giving up, of resigning, of relinquishing, of stepping down. To abandon. To forsake. So my question is. What have you abdicated? What have you abandoned? What have you given up? What have you forsaken? What have you handed over and turned over? You know, scripture talks about Esau. How he turned over, how he gave up his rightful place, his birthright for being the firstborn. There is an inheritance that is, that is automatically given to the firstborn. Male, especially. But he gave it up for food, for something that was so temporal. That was a right now gratification. Hebrews 12, 16. Says, least there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one more morsel of meat sold his birthright. And in Romans, 913 says that's why we 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 mm. as it is written Jacob have I loved Esau have I hated why do you think the Lord hated him because his birthright meant nothing to him he despised it Genesis 25, 29 says, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Esau. And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. 
And Esau said, behold, I am at the point to die. We exaggerate so much. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? Like, birthright ain't going to do nothing for me right now. I'm, I'm so hungry. I'm famished. And Jacob said, swear unto me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You want to get mad? And you want to be angry at. And for some hate. Another individual. Because of something you despised and let go. Because of something you didn't cherish. They cherished it more than you did. I'm going to read this in the Amplified, Genesis 25, 29 through 34. And Jacob was boiling pottage, lentil stew, one day when Esau came from the field and was faint with hunger. And Esau said to Jacob, I beg you, let me have some of that red lentil stew to eat, for I am faint and famished. That is why his name was called Esau, Red. And Jacob answered, then sell me today your birthright, the rights of a firstborn. Esau said, see here, I am at the point of death. What good can this birthright do me? He abdicated. Jacob said, swear to me today that you are selling it to me. And he swore to Jacob and sold him his birthright. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau scorned his birthright as beneath his notice. It meant nothing to him. Because at this point, It wasn't his yet because his dad didn't physically bless him with it. He, his dad was still alive. So within his father's hands, it wasn't uh, sold and bestowed unto him in fullness yet, but it was his right to have. So because he wasn't walking in it. Because he didn't have it physically. In his hands. It didn't mean a thing to him. So if that be you today. I would encourage you to repent. Don't be sorry. Unless it's godly sorrow. Catch a hold of godly sorrow. Don't look for the right now gratification, the right now momentary pleasure instead of the long term abundance. Some of you have made 
right now decisions, not looking at the long-term effects of your right now decision. And so you're going to get to if the Lord grants you that. You're going to get to that 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 future and wish you had decided something differently. Now you're playing catch up if you're evil and even able to do that. The shoulda, coulda, woulda. But had you listened to sound instruction given to you way back then, you would have been set up very differently in your now. But pride prevented you to do that because you thought you can do things your way under your own strength, under your own talent, under your own gift. Thinking is all about you. Because I need it right now, like Esau. I'm faint. I'm firmish. I'm about to die. I need it right now. And ending up, mm, I believe that is still in Hebrews. Yes. Hebrews 12, 17. I read 16, but I'm going to, I'm going to read it again. Least there be any fornicator and profane person. As Esau, giving you some of his character traits, who for one morsel of meat sowed his birthright. For ye know that how, for ye, for ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of, excuse me, repentance, though he sought it. Carefully with tears. This is written for our example. So we don't follow after the way of Esau. So we're not abdicating what is rightfully ours. Because we're not physically walking in it or physically um, possessing it. But it's ours to possess. But we got to walk through the process to get to the possession. What good does it do me now when I don't even have it in my hand? What good is it going to do me now? For ye know that afterwards, when he would have, and when it was his time to inherit, When it was his time to take possession and to take hold of his inheritance, he was rejected. He said, Dad, just bless me. He said, I can't bless you with the firstborn blessing because I've already bestowed it on to your brother. You're going, to, you're going to end up serving him instead of the other way around. But then God did orchestrate that when they were in their mother's womb. I'm going to read Genesis 25, starting at the first, the 21st verse. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled, struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so 
why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. She wanted to know why, why am I going through this in my womb? What Lord, what's going on? She didn't go to her husband. She went to the Lord. This is what the Lord said to her. Verse 23. The Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve, excuse me, the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out. And his hand took hold of Esau's heel. And his name was Jacob. And Esau was three, three score years old when she bore them. So it was already ordained from the womb that the older was going to serve the younger. You got two nations, two manner of people in your womb. That's why. So they were struggling and fighting even in the womb. Excuse me. <sighs> if you have an opportunity to pick up what you dropped, if, because Esau didn't. And we have to understand that there are consequences to our actions. Scripture says, which I just read, Esau was rejected and he sought repentance with tears, but was found, but did not find any repentance. Don't despise a gift or call because you might not be walking actively in it. Don't forsake and put down and walk away and turn your back on a call or a gifting because you don't quite understand it. Or because it may not make sense to you. It is easy to just walk away, but it shows resilience when you stand firm, when you walk out to completion, that process to get from point A to point B. You're learning something during that developmental time. You're learning something. You're unlearning something. But we don't trust the process of the Lord because it's painful. Oh, yes. Thank you, 
We don't trust the Lord. And we want to take manners into our own hands. We don't trust his process. We don't trust the ways that he wants to do with me. Because we got to know the ifs, ands, and the buts. It has to make sense to us. It has to make sense to us. God's way is not our way. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I'm going to the Amplified. Says the exact same thing. So it needs no more explanatory. Needs no more explanation. But he's not going to do things according to your way. He ain't you. He ain't me. His ways are higher than our way. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Because his way is clean and pure and perfect. So, I want to encourage you to trust the Lord, to lean not to your own understanding on what you perceive a thing to be or assume to be, because more than likely, it is not what you think it is. Isaiah 55, 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. But the caveat is. We got to forsake and we have to return. That's what repentance is. That's not what being sorry is. Godly sorrow worketh. Second Corinthians seven ten. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto I'm sorry, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death.
Second Corinthians seven ten. I don't need nobody feeling sorry for me. But if you're a man or a woman of prayer and God actually hears you, keep me in prayer. If God don't hear you, don't pray for me. Second Corinthians 7, 10 in the Amplified reads, it says, for godly grief, and the pain God is permitted to direct produces a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. And it never brings regret, but worldly grief, the hopeless sorrow that is characteristics of the pagan world is deadly, breeding and ending in death. I'm going to be honest with you, I have not read this before in the Amplified. So that is quite interesting. For godly grief and the pain God is permitted to direct produce a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. And it never brings regret, but worldly grief, the hopeless sorrow that is characteristic of the pagan world is deadly, breeding and ending in death. Wow. Wow. That's something. That is something. It produces a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil. So, if you're not repentant via godly sorrow, you haven't repented. You're just sorry the world's way. Which only breeds death and hopelessness and regret. So someone's coming to you being sorry and not repentant, I'm being honest, they don't mean it. It's not real to them. They're not hurt by the fact that they hurt you. That's what godly sorrow does. When something hurts you, when you are tired of your sin and that thing hurts you because you hurt the Lord in doing that, when it doesn't shake your very foundation that you hurt the Lord every time you engage in something that separates you from him, that's not godly sorrow. You're just sorry. Which leaves the door open for you to do it again and again and again which breeds sinful patterns. Because it hasn't hurt you yet. You're not hurt because you hurt the Lord. So when you do that to the Lord, you don't have a problem doing that to another individual.
We got church folk hurting church folk. We got wives hurting husbands and husbands hurting wives and children hurting parents and parents hurting children. But yet we're going on anyhow. We don't make things right with people that we hurt, but we're going on anyhow. Why Satan's sitting back saying, look at the division that I caused. How much more division can I call? That's just not enough. He's not satisfied. But he sits back in, he sits, he sits back in his, his spirit of pride, trying to come up with other means of bringing division in the body of Christ and in your house. What you going to do with that? You're just going to keep being sorry? Instead of being repentive? I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I said those words to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Instead of saying, you know what? I need you to forgive me. Because and repentance, there's an acknowledgement of what you did wrong. When you're sorry, you don't have to acknowledge anything that you did wrong. There's no accountability in being sorry. There's excuses, but no accountability. But when there's godly sorrow and repentance, you have acknowledged, I did this. I caused this pain to you. There's an acknowledgement. There's a humility. Because it takes an act of humility to humble yourself, to acknowledge that you've done something wrong that you need to repent for. But we're too full of pride. We won't humble ourselves and acknowledge that I caused a pain. I caused a division. I caused the separation. It's because of something that I've done. But we're going on anyhow. Because I'm coming under the blood. That's the deception of the enemy. So I would encourage you. To say no to your flesh. And if your flesh wants to be prideful, do the opposite and be humble. If your flesh wants to be sorrowed, sorry, do the opposite and be repentant. If your flesh wants to deny, do the opposite and take accountability. At the end of the day, we're all servants to something, someone. I'm not somebody that pretends. And I don't, I'm not a faker. I, I don't wear, I don't pretend to be something that I'm not. I never have. I come before you broken. I come before you hurt. I'm fighting back tears. Still doing the work of the Lord. Because I don't take breaks because my feelings are hurt. I don't take breaks because I'm not loved. I don't take breaks because I'm not protected. I don't take breaks because I'm not covered. I don't take breaks because people don't keep their word to me. I don't take breaks because you hurt me, you wound me. 
I cry. I bandage myself and I go back in. God be the glory. I pray that you have a prosperous week. Right, it was something that I said that stirred you, that provoked you, that caused you to examine yourself. I pray that you open up the door. The Lord is knocking on. Stop speaking to him through the door. And open it up and hear what he has to say to you. Concerning you. Concerning him. Concerning whatever is on his heart. See how we look. I love you.